We are putting the engine from Honda's fastest motorcycle into their slowest scooter. And this week, we're gonna to try to get it to start for the first time. I've never seen that happen, ever. I've wired everything, and I think it is time to see if it works. It's not gonna fire because we're missing some stuff. I'm waiting on UPS. Come on, UPS. Quick, a little more fast. I think everything works, so I'll just take off this panel and show you guys what I did. Basically, extended all the wires, took the wiring from the stock stuff on the Ruckus, brought it back to the CBR, wired it into that, and it should, in theory, work now perfectly fine. Okay. Here's some relays clicking. Let's see. Nice. In theory, once we have everything together, this should just work OEM style. This is kind of the first thing that I've made that has buttons that actually do things. Most of the stuff I just like twist wires together and send it, but this one's pretty legit. There's a whole bee's nest back by the wiring thing, so I have to like tiptoe around and like snip wires and gather wires without getting stung. It's a journey every single time. Ethan's focused on the shop right now, and um, I've never got to like make my own gas tank, so that's what I'm gonna be doing today. The problem is, is with this ruckus, the gas feed line is like super teeny tiny. That's like an air line on the CBR, and we need something more like this. So I'm gonna basically cut this off, drill it, and then try to weld this onto this super thin metal. But I think I can do it, because I've been practicing TIG. The only problem is, when I bought this ruckus, I lost the key, like right away. I don't know how that happened, but we're just not gonna talk about it. So I'm just gonna drill this out, make sure there's no gas in there, cut the bottom off. Wow. I had the key and then I think I put it in my pants pocket so I never saw it again. No. Ethan, no, no, shit. Nice. I'm just gonna take that boot off so I get full control. I thought I got all the fuel out of this, but like I was welding that and I think a little burst of fire just came and like kissed my elbow. That was janky. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. There's a tip over sensor on the ruckus and I want to keep it. You, there is a way to add like a resistor in there and just like delete it from the system. But I think it's important that if this bike tips over, which I think it might, I'm just going to put the tip over sensor in a location where it's hidden and then I'm going to put most of the wiring under the seat anyway. I think I pulled this mount off like a 450 out there or something, but it fits the sensor perfectly and that's why we keep everything at Grind Hard because you never know what you're gonna need. Making a little battery holder. So I just got the measurements off of a lithium battery that we have here. That's what I'm gonna be using in the ruckus. There'll just be a strap that goes through, wraps around the battery. Really simple stuff. Um, but those batteries are only like a pound, so this thin metal will be able to hold it easily. The battery will just sit right there. Let's 
So Ethan made this super sick Rackus badge for the CBR 1000 Ruckus, um, and I'm gonna install it. I've been thinking on where I wanna install it. I'm thinking maybe right there. What do you think, Cameron and Steve? I mean, I think that's a good spot to me. It's like noticeable. It's not gonna get hidden by anything. So I thought now, because I'm waiting on parts for the electronics, would be a good time to try to get this welded on there. Waiting on the things that make spark, I think, but ah, I just want to drive it right now. Every single machine that I've made up at this property has a terrible shifting mechanism. The 24 hour project was probably the worst one because you had to reach down next to the ground behind you and actuate a shifter with the clutch. <laughs> terrible um the shopping cart was a little better uh, but it still kind of didn't feel right and you had to take your hand off the steering wheel this i really want it to be a bike shifter like on a motorcycle but this whole front frame here is aluminum and i don't know how to weld aluminum so I'm gonna have to kind of think outside the box here. Is that the UPS, man? Yeah, who is that? Oh, it's UPS! Hopefully they have some of the stuff to make this thing start. That'd be sick. to make the push rod for the shifter so i'm just gonna make it out of this old like car rack that was your my, old car that rack. was mine <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're using well, at least it's getting used i need i need part of this metal one of my old shift linkages and as you can see it looks a little interesting this is a specimen we don't talk about anymore. So I'm just gonna hide that. So people don't find that. Cold turkey is great on sandwiches, but there's better ways to break bad habits. I'm talking about this video sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of crazy dramatic change, why not just remove the bad from the habit? Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, it uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses all natural, delicious flavors. Fume makes replacing your bad habit easy. It has an adjustable airflow dial. Listen to how satisfying. All kinds of magnets and high quality parts make this thing great for fidgeting. This gives your fingers a lot to do, which is good for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your bad habit. The flavors are all really good and a lot stronger than I thought. It's like a good flavor in your mouth. It kind of lingers for a while. And just the weight of this thing, it all feels and tastes really good. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Head to tryfume.com slash grindhard or scan the QR code and use code grindhard to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code grindhard to save 10% on your order today. Take a weld around that, and then I'm gonna retap this and just put a little joint at the end and that screws in there and then do the same on the other side and I'll have a shifter. All right, it's really the time of truth. We're gonna see if this shift situation works or not. I just gotta drill this hole a little bigger. Oh man, drilling with broken ribs is not clean. Oh, it's a little scary.
aftermarket fuel pump showed up. We're not gonna go with the housing that came on the CBR because it's big. It has to be in here to be useful. Eh? And our original plan, we were gonna just like cut this down and put it on the back, but it's ugly. It's very ugly. So Ethan's been putting these in what the uh, uh, everything, lately. pretty much everything. Uh, so. There's one in the mini truck and the mini Cooper. Uh, it's just a super nice modular. It comes with the filter and the pump and this little bracket, and it's pretty cheap. And it's got AN fittings. Yeah, like 80 bucks for yeah. all of this. 80 bucks for the whole setup. So That's insane. Not so. bad. Uh, and then they're universal, so we know like we have them all in a bunch of things. And if one goes out, we can swap it or swap buy it. a new one exactly like it. Yeah. So we figured out that the CBR really just uses a positive and a negative to yeah, control Yeah, I mean, the fuel most pump. fuel pumps do. Nothing special there, so I'm just going to make a little mount to put it back here. I think it'll look pretty cool. We can Google what the actual fuel pressure that this wants, mm -hmm. and then we can set this to exactly that. That didn't stick. <laughs> no, it's in a pretty weird angle to do. I think it worked out. It's pretty cool. And I think the fuel pump adds a lot of cool factor to this thing. It just looks very premium now. It just looks very premium. Premium, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I really like this fuel pump setup, but it comes with like an AN10 fitting on it. It's like absolutely- Yeah, it's like house hose fitting. Yeah, it's, it's massive. I mean, it is a 300 liter per hour pump, so, but even still, it's super, super overkill. So I had to, um, I took that fitting and I actually just tapped it out to adapt to the threads for this fitting. So now it's just a double fitting there. It's um, time to see if there's any leaks. We got a gauge here. Will mm -hmm. likes the look of the gauge, so we're just it gonna leave it so on there. It looks so cool. It looks oh, like, I you didn't know. Notice that. Yeah, it looks so. kind of steampunky. Gotcha. Yeah. Nice. Primes. So, uh, but we need to put some gas in there so we can yeah. see if it actually pressurizes. I'm so excited to make sure that everything that we did works. Honestly, it probably gets like 10, 11 miles to a gallon in its current format. So I could almost go from Sandpoint to work every day, which would be really nice. I think there's fluid coming somewhere. I thought I remembered maybe not tightening something. It says, fuel, the manual talks about 50 PSI of static fuel pressure that is at idle. If you were to test it, it'd probably go down to 38 to 40 PSI at redline. Ooh. Look at all that pressure. Okay. About 30. Why are you... Oh, it's speeding up. We're about ready for liftoff, folks. This should work for Will's uh, adapter thingy here. We're going from a three bolt pattern from this hub just because we have it as a part to a four bolt pattern for this brake rotor because again, we have it and you know, it'll work. Oh, also right now, that's about one to one. Look at that. Wow, that's actually very close. Surprisingly close for not trying. I stole the caliper from the ZX6R that we used for the reverse three-wheeler a couple months back. I think a real sport bike brake is going to be a little bit better of an option, especially to stop a sport bike engine on a little scooter. I 
I cut out an Ethan tab. I'm gonna cut out another one. Well, that's not the right ground. I think so. Will's part came, which it means we need to tip this thing on its side so that the, uh, yeah, put the gas cap on, bro. Yeah. So that the oil doesn't all come out. The time has finally come. I think everything is put together and in and working like it should. We should have spark. We have air. Hopefully we have compression. And this thing should start. I'm honestly kind of worried because this is the longest I've taken on a project. And if something goes wrong with this engine or something is off, it's just gonna be like really disappointing, so. Just not want any fire yet. That sounded good. That was a very real start, and it's because there's a massive amount of air coming out of the top crankcase vent. So, not like a massive amount, like a blown piston ring, but like there's air coming out of there, and when I stuck my pinky in, that was a massive air leak. So I think we're just battling air leaks right now because this engine's super smart and um, kind of like a Subaru. If you've got a vacuum leak, they don't like to run. So I'm gonna plumb something into there so that it can read on this little cylinder right here and we'll get back to you. Maybe we'll start. <laughs> We have everything. We have fuel, we have spark, we have air. What we don't have and what I don't think we have is maybe not compression. This compression tester that I got didn't come with the right fitting. I should have just got the more expensive one. I was like, oh nice, a slightly cheaper one. And the only fitting that it doesn't have in it is the one that we need. So uh, I took one of the fittings that did come with that is like a weird tractor size or something and I uh, welded it onto a spark plug and blew out all the junk in the spark plug so it's just a straight hole. I don't know if that's the thing that I built being broken or if it's actually broken. 30 PSI? So I think it's supposed to be like 95 PSI. Oh no. But what this thing is saying is that compression does not check out. According to the service manual, 174 PSI of compression is what it should have. 174 PSI. I've found the issue. I think we have a ring problem on cylinder two and four. Cause I put 10W40 down the cylinder walls of those two cylinders, which would have lowered the gap between the ring and the cylinder wall. And it would have allowed it to have compression again. And it fired up right away. This is a very advanced engine. It freaks me out going in this deep. If we pull this head off and there is no damage, then I just took the head off for no reason and now we have to replace the head gasket. But on the other hand, if I pull it and there is damage, then I have to replace pistons. Oh. The weird thing is that looks fine. Yeah. That looks completely fine. No scoring, nothing. 
But we had like no compression in there. I don't understand. Will, you sold us a bad engine. <laughs> this was a. Uh... Yeah, so I think there's a main reason why this wasn't running. I took the top end off. And at first glance, it's like, wow, look how nice this is in here. And then and if you then, look closely, there's a whole chunk of cylinder coating missing right there. Yeah, which would lose us compression. Yeah, right at the top. So you're right going compression, head. compression, compression. No compression. All goes away. Compression again. Yeah. So, Wait. oh, there's two chunks missing on this. There's one missing here, too. On the lower part. How does that even happen? I don't know. I've never seen it just I've delaminate like I've that. I surely thought when I took the top off, it was going to be like a bent piston or something like catastrophic. So you said the other one was super low was this outside one, Yeah, right? it was the outside one was the second one that was showing low compression. I'm not feeling anything funky on that one. I'm going to pull this off a little deeper, check the rings on the pistons and see if the gapping's right, if maybe one of them's messed up. Yeah, that ring's completely seized. Yeah, those, those are rings stuck. are totally stuck. We have seized rings, boys. So seized I think rings. what we do is we free up, yeah, look at that, see? We That's what them. they should do. They should just totally pop out when, oh. you, when you pull it apart. Mm. The ring should just pop right out. Eventually, if you could have got it to run long enough to heat cycle, these almost certainly would have freed up. More because they're not like rusted, they're just That's seized crazy. from sitting. I've never seen that happen, ever. How many old bike engines that have been sitting for I've a never year, opened any of them. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've never seen that on a Subaru. They're always like totally shrecked. Yeah, it's because they're all worn out. Yeah. You can see how it's shiny here, yeah. and then suddenly the shininess stops and all the way to there. You can see where You can see that that out. wasn't even touching the cylinder wall as it was going yeah. up and down. This part was, so it got repolished. This part, Man. right there, it's so seized into that ring land that it wasn't even touching. That's ridiculous. I'm just... Like, I would have never even thought about seized rings. Yeah, that's the main thing that causes engines to not run after they've been sitting for a long time. Seized rings. Just cleaning them all off. Reinstalling them. I took a break from wiring the new shop to help Will get this engine recrafted. Will likes to use the word crafted. It's never been more appropriate than this engine. <laughs> he literally crafted. Um, this is not at all the right answer. We should definitely get new pistons and a new cylinder for this. We don't really know how well anything else works, and we also don't want to wait two weeks for things to get here. Yeah. So we're just going to slap it back together. We got crafty, we pulled all the rings out, and, um, you know, cleaned them up and, and made them all unsticky. So that's a big part of the, part of the problem is all the rings were stuck. Um, that one cylinder with the chunk missing, that's just going to be the way it is. But I think that given how stuck all the rings were, if we put it back together like this, it should at least run. Yeah. So we can get everything else worked out, make sure that it drives, get all the systems work. And then if it runs well enough, we'll just leave it until it blows up. If it barely runs at all, we'll order a rebuild kit. And then while we're finishing everything else, then we can rebuild we can, it. We can rebuild it, but we might as well put it back together. I mean, there's so much wrong with it that if we blow the whole thing up and grenade it, it's really not that much different than just starting from scratch. Trying. is at 120 State Street in Montpelier, which is located directly across the I love the that place. That's my hometown. Permits and motorcycle permits are now done online only. Before, you could just spin this over, and it would just spin really easy. Now, let's see. Are you stressed out, Will? Yeah, I'm really stressed. It's time to find out if our handcrafted engine is going to work. Yeah. Well, that was something. That was more than we've ever had, almost. Well, that was, that was more than any time. Yeah. Yeah. All right.
Yeah, now it's just a, a situation of like, uh, it probably, these aren't tightened. There's like a whole bunch of things that just kind of need to be tidied up for to yeah. probably idle, but. No, it idles, but it won't rev. I can't believe homemade rings. Handcrafted rings. I mean, it does smoke. And a used head gasket. But you know what? Like a two stroke. It runs. It runs on handcrafted things. I can't believe the fuel pressure is what was making it. Yeah, I mean, I saw it sitting there at 60 and I figured, you know, I bet maybe it's it, a little too high. Well, yeah, I had just cranked it up because I thought maybe our problem was the opposite. That broke the sound barrier. It's pretty bad. Trucks. I mean, I was on this end of the exhaust at least. And so if that you're end, back there, it shatters your it's mind. It's pretty bad. <laughs> Listen oh to that God. choppy idle too. That's awesome. It's just everything I expected. And I think be. as it warms up, I mean, obviously not right now because we don't yeah. have the coolant hooked up, but once we get the radiator all filled and stuff, we should just run heat it. cycle it a few times, let it run, get it, it warmed up and rev it, and, you know, just kind of, yeah. because the rings might also just seat better. That already was less smoke than it started with yeah. that last time I started it, so. It runs Rings. actually surprisingly good. And it starts like every time now. And yeah. It's really great. It it's sounds awesome. fantastic. Yeah. And honestly, there's not even that much more to do before it drives. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, if you threw a chain on it right now, you could kind of drive it. Kind of But drive. you wouldn't have a rear brake. Yeah. And also, there's a lot of parts of your frame that aren't welded. Yeah. I was noticing that when we were moving it around. It was like boing, boing, boing. Yeah. So, Partially because the front of this bike is like made for two horses. You might as well just finish it. Yeah. Weld, take the engine out, weld everything properly, and while you're at it, paint it, and then we can do a test drive. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Make it very nice. Give it the best chance of not breaking on the first test drive is yeah. the, uh, the idea here. If you watched our one of our recent episodes where we bought a golf cart with essentially Yamaha's version of this same engine from the same era, actually yeah. the same year. <laughs> That golf cart is alarmingly fast and it's a thousand pounds or so. I don't know how much yeah. it weighs, at least a thousand. This thing <laughs> probably weighs about 300 pounds. Yeah, And uh, total. It has that same 180 horsepower. 